Let, let's get going. First of all, thank you to everyone who's joined for the January ECSS Symposium. I would like to introduce Yan Liu from NCSA, the Cyber GIS Center. So Yan and I have worked together for, I would say, over 10 years on the TerraGrid Science Gateway Program and the Cyber GIS Program, and you're in for a real treat today. This is definitely um, a project that really showcases the impact of high performance computing. So Yan's going to talk to us about a couple of different um, related ECSS projects that he's been involved in. Uh, one is called the National Flood Interoperability Experiment, and this is with David Maidmont at UT Austin. And what, what this is, is we, we now have high resolution terrain data, uh, 10 meter and finer, and also um, high resolution water data. And when you combine those, um, you ha you, you're able to predict flooding in real time. And this is like quite a monumental um, ac activity as you'll hear from, from Jan, but um, they've been able to do continental scale flood simulations in the United States with this, um, th this, this high resolution data using supercomputers, both in Exceed and also the Roger system at NCSA. Uh, coupled with that is work that Yan has done with David Tarboten out at Utah State with the Tau DEM software. And DEM is a di digital elevation model. And so what this is allowing you to do is, given terrain data, um, understand where, where, where the flow is going to be directed based on that terrain. And so that's you know, intricately connected to flooding. Uh, and so these two projects dovetail really nicely. Um, and with that, I think I'll let Yan get going. Also, if you have questions throughout, uh, type them into the chat, and then I'll collect them and kind of feed them to the speaker as we go. But you can ask questions um, throughout. There are presentations on several different um, related topics. Please mute yourself if you're not speaking. I'll do the same. Um, and with that, why don't you take it away, Yan? Thank you, Nancy, for the nice introduction. Um, everyone, <coughs> uh, Happy New Year. Uh, I'm Yan Liu. Uh, I'm a senior research programmer in uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, in this talk, I'll introduce <coughs> two highly related ECSS projects surrounding the methodology, new methodology de uh, being developed in hydrology community called continental hydrology. <coughs> Excuse me. So the two projects, uh, the first one is NEFI, National Flood Interoperability Experiment, led by PI David Maidman at UT Austin. Uh, this is also a multi-year project. The first part was accelerating an award model called RAPID. That part was, was done in 2005, and Silio and John Kansas at Tech did a wonderful job to accelerate the model uh, from hours to seconds. Uh, I think they gave a previous talk before, but I couldn't find the link. <clears throat> so if you want to refer to that part of work, please contact Liu or John. And the second project is TauDM. It is a high performance terrain analysis software. It is used as a core piece of software in the NAFI workflow. So they are highly related. And the TauDM project has, uh, has been going on also multiple years. And for both projects, uh, and the TDM project is led by PI David Tabaton, a hydrologist in Utah State University. For both projects, I'll only cover the work in year 2016. Uh, I'll give a background on the uh, inundation mapping and the methodology behind, and uh, describe the computation, computational challenges and the strategies we took. And I'll uh, detail on the acceleration of a tau DM uh, piece and the, the computation of the two uh, products in NAFI. One is uh, called HAND, uh, and uh, the other is the annotation mapping. And I'll have some discussion uh, uh, in the ECSS and the gateway uh, domain. <laughs> so this is our team. Uh, UT Austin, Utah State, and the UIUC uh, including a commercial company, ASRI, which is the leading uh, GIS company, uh, work together to develop the methodology and the computational workflow. Um, uh, USGS, as a data provider for the elevation and hydrography data set, 
uh, give us uh, the details on the data and uh, propose some methodological uh, refinements uh, in our uh, workflows. And RANCI uh, uh, hosts a uh, hydro hydrology data portal called HydroShare, also has the IROTs deployed, and we work with them to uh, mount the IROTs on our cluster to share the intermediate results for the methodology development. And NCAR and the NOAA Net National Weather Service, they, uh, they developed the national water model uh, which this work hopefully will integrate into that model later with the forecast information on water. <laughs> so, oops. Uh, let me give you some background on the national scale uh, real-time flood inundation mapping. Um, the, exi the existing method uh, only covers 130 stream gauge and done pretty much manually. And um, the cost was estimated to be $500 per mile, and it currently it only covers a few, uh, a little bit above 1,000 miles. Uh, while on the other hand, the national water model from NOAA currently compiles, uh, actually, uh, sorry, the, the USGS data hydrography data set actually compiles uh, more than 2.6 million um, flow lines and covering 2.3, uh, 3.2 million uh, miles in land. So if we were to do it manually uh, for this uh, level of uh, flow line information, river segments, uh, it'll cost about $1.6 $1 billion. Uh, it's not affordable. So uh, researchers started developing a methodology called continental hydrology, which de defines the flow con uh, continent model and treats the whole nation uh, or the continent uh, as the subject of a study. So usually the hydrologists work on the local watersheds. Now they, they work on the nation um, directly, but that means a lot of data size and computational challenges that they have never uh, experienced it before. Most of their current work is done at desktop uh, computing level. So uh, the national water model uh, incorporates the meteorological uh, forecast from the, uh, from the National Weather Service and computes the hydro hydrological and the hydraulic properties and when you combine for the whole uh, country and uh, combined with uh, the forecast, real-time forecast, you can view the inundation maps as you view the for, uh, weather forecast maps uh, in, a real, in real time, and you can actually derive a lot of more impactful maps from there. Um, the national water model currently uh, works on 2.7 million catchments, uh, river segments. Um, it doesn't cover the whole U.S. terrain, so the purpose of uh, NAFI is to transform these forecasts into any location in the U.S., not only where water flows. So in order to transform the weather forecast into flood risk, uh, there, uh, we use a methodology called uh, uh, HAND. This is one of the reference elevation data set we compute so that with the water depth forecast from uh, national water model, you can compare with a reference height to see if your place is uh, inundated or not. The calculation of this hand, the height above nearest uh, uh, drainage is illustrated here. Uh, so you, you only compute the rel uh, relative height above the uh, bottom of the nearest drainage, which is a river and keep that uh, as a one, and we only need to compute that once. And once you know the water depth forecast, if the water depth is above the hand value, then the place is inundated. By saying any location, uh, we're introducing the digital elevation model, which gridizes the, 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 the whole nation into 10 meter by 10 meter resolutions, if the DEM is 10 meter resolution. And the USGS provides the national elevation uh, data set. That was, that's the old name. The new, made, new name is uh, three depth, <coughs> 3D depth, uh, 3D elevation program. Um, and they are producing higher resolution DMs than 10 meter resolution. 
at 10 meter resolution, the number of cells, uh, 10 meter by 10 meter cells, uh, to cover the whole nation is about 180 billion. <coughs> And if we go to one meter, uh, uh, the size will uh, be at least 100 times bigger. So if we want to give a forecast for uh, every location of the US, uh, this is the methodology that we're taking uh, uh, to calculate the hand first and take the forecast uh, and compare with the hand to come up with the inundation map. And uh, the year uh, six, uh, 16 work uh, was to explore whether it's possible to do so at a national level, given the, data, the big data size. Um, and uh, these are the two data sets I mentioned, national hydrography data set. If you look at the clogged uh, bluish map, those are the flow lines covering the US, uh, 2.7 million river segments. And on the right is the uh, National elevation data set, which is about um, 700 gigabytes uncompressed. And we, uh, we did this research uh, and development on uh, Roger uh, cluster uh, at NCSA, which is a third tier exceed resource. It is uh, through an NSF MRI grant uh, for dedicated cyber GIS research and development. Um, well, so I, I mentioned the two things. One is to compute the hand. The other is to compute the inundation map. So let me go one by one. Uh, this is the computational workflow to compute the hand raster for the whole nation. Uh, when we gather the input from the uh, 10 meter resolution uh, grid uh, uh, raster, we say it is a raster in geospatial uh, format. Um, first, we pre-process it the DEM uh, to remove uh, the obstacles. Uh, for example, if a road uh, crosses a, a, water, a, a river channel and the elevation would be higher than actually the, the water, water channel, so we have to cut the road and modify the DEM a little bit. Then also, in the DEM-based uh, uh, hydrological model, it assumes that the water flows from the, uh, the inlet to the outlet. So the water flow cannot be stuck anywhere. So we have to identify the uh, places where uh, water stuck. <laughs> the way we do it is called uh, uh, a process uh, pit removal. Uh, first, we flood the whole terrain of the US. Then we let the flood retreat. Uh, after the retreat, retreat uh, the places where the water still stays um, compose the uh, flat uh, the pits, and uh, we raise the elevation of those pit cells um, in order to let the water flow. After that, we get a uh, hydrologically conditioned uh, DEM. Then we do the flow direction uh, uh, calculation. Uh, this is the um, uh, computational bottleneck. It's a very slow in the original version. <laughs> So now, after that, you get a, a flow model for the whole nation at 10 meter, meter resolution. Uh, but that's purely derived from the, the terrain data. It's nothing related to the actual water. So we only, but we only need to care about the, the uh, place where the water is there, actually. So to e extract the water information, we take the national hydrography data that we call NHD plus. Uh, it's a media resolution, uh, one kilometer resolution, uh, to extract the headwater, the channel heads, um, from the flow lines. For each flow line, uh, it's defined by uh, uh, a line with a starting and end. Uh, the starting point is the inlet, and the end point is outlet. <laughs> if any flow line the inlet has is not also it's not an outlet of any other flow lines. It becomes a channel head. So we get that channel head points and uh, rasterize that as a, a weight grid to calculate the catch flow catchment. <laughs> From there, we derive a stream raster that defines where the water actually flows. <laughs> and from there. Uh, and with the uh, flow direction map, we can calculate the vertical distances to the nearest uh, uh, drainage and derive the hand raster. And we only need to do that once uh, per USGS DEM update. And we can combine that uh, to calculate the inundation for this map.
Uh, the computational challenge, as I mentioned, the input data is large, uh, both uh, raster uh, DM data and uh, vector data uh, in hydrology. Uh, and the computing challenge is on both the parallel computing part, I.O., memory, and network. So the way we uh, explored, uh, by the time the, the, the project started, uh, had two levels of uh, decomposition. Uh, first, we decompose the whole nation into uh, hydrological units, and we, did, we, we didn't need to develop anything. It's done by hydrologists uh, over so many years of uh, hand drawing the uh, boundary of each uh, watershed hierarchically. Um, so that part, we make sure we only work on individual uh, watersheds, and within each watershed, uh, we use a tau DEM uh, to uh, process the information um, in parallel. So this is an example of the hydrological unit. Uh, it has different levels. We're currently working on HUC6 level, which has uh, about 370 uh, units for the whole US and uh, 331 for the continental US. So uh, at this level, for all the HUC6 units, we use the high throughput computing method to treat each uh, HUC6 unit as an individual computing job. Within the HUC6 unit, we apply the tau DEM for parallel computing. Uh, so let me switch a little bit to the uh, uh, intro uh, hydro unit part, tau DEM acceleration. Uh, we did uh, some performance analysis and uh, developed a new algorithm on the flow directions. Uh, and the uh, Tau DM as part of the ECS has also involves uh, uh, some tasks to uh, extend the Tau DM to be community services. Uh, we found that part too. So uh, Tau DM uses the MPI uh, to decompose a DM and uh, uh, does all the calculation and use the parallel IO or the sequential IO to uh, output a similar size uh, DM. The parallel computing part in Tau DM basically simply de decompose a DM uh, according to the row-wise or block-wise decomposition and uh, establishes the uh, ghost zones for boundary uh, cell data exchange among uh, neighboring uh, processors. The bottleneck <coughs> comes uh, when the each individual algorithm is developed. The, from year 14 work we did in ECSS to accelerate tau DM, we identified three uh, cost, most costly functions. The two of them are used uh, in the NEFI project, the flow direction, the two flow direction algorithms. They actually took most of the time. Uh, that's the focus of this talk. Uh, you can see the performance uh, data here. It takes hours to process only a small portion, portion of the US and it cannot be used for, uh, for the whole US uh, scale. So that was the problem. And, uh, and the, we tried benchmark and the profiling to see if we can uh, accelerate service, uh, the, the computation to, uh, to uh, make it uh, run faster. We couldn't do much. So in 2016, we decided to rewrite the parallel algorithms. So let me introduce a little bit about the flow direction algorithm. So uh, for the flow, direction algorithms, you have uh, an elevation grid. Uh, if you know the if the neighboring cells have elevation difference, it's easy. You just calculate the slopes. And based on the steepest of, uh, slope, you, you uh, assign the flow direction um, to every cell. The, that's not the computationally expensive part. The expensive part lies in the resolving of the flats. Where, uh, the, which is a, a set of uh, contiguous cells with the same elevation. Uh, in those cases, uh, you have to derive the flow direction for each flat star cell to make sure that they actually flow and they flow from the uh, inlet to outlet 
and they don't cross each other, or there's no any ambiguity on the flow direction for each cell. Uh, it's done uh, in one algorithm. Uh, this, in this algorithm, there, we create uh, two gradient surfaces for the flat cells. In the diagram, the dark cells uh, denote uh, the uh, inlet cells with the higher elevation, and uh, the light gray cell is the outlet with the cell with uh, the lower uh, elevation. All other cells in the middle are flat. So we calculate first the gradient surface toward the, uh, the outlet cell. Uh, this is a, I, I think the diagram is, uh, is clear enough. Uh, uh, you just incrementally uh, increase the elevation uh, based on the uh, locality to the distance to the outlet cell. And similarly, you can calculate another gradient uh, surface for the cells away from the uh, inlet cells. And you combine them together, then you have the uh, flow directions derived. And in that process, after the process, if you see uh, also new flags coming out, you can call this function recursively to resolve uh, until there's no flags. This is a sequential algorithm. In the original uh, implementation, the sequential algorithm was implemented very inefficiently. Uh, when, when, we lab when, uh, when the cells are labeled, uh, all the cells uh, la uh, are labeled uh, one uh, first, then increment uh, to two, three, four. So each, uh, so uh, a lot of cells are visited multiple times during the, this iterative process. That's not efficient. So we change the sequential algorithm to visit each flat cell only once. That increases the performance a lot. For the parallel computing part, uh, so this is the, the, the diagram on the bottom illustrates the distribution of the flats. You can see that uh, the, the flats actually are sparsely distributed. And if the parallel algorithm knows where the flats are, and if the flats are local to the processor, it can process it without communication. Um, the, in the old algorithm, regardless, it doesn't have a knowledge of the, where the flats are, how big the flat uh, is, and uh, regardless of whether uh, it's flat or not, no, on the boundary, it communicates, which is not efficient. So our general strategy is to identify where the flats are using an efficient scanning uh, technique uh, used in computer vision called connected component labeling. Uh, it visits each cell only once and identifies all the flags. And for the local flags, we don't do the communication at all. We process at each of individual processors. And for shared flags, we do the communication um, and revise the algorithm a little bit to optimize the commu uh, communication and update on the gradients. Yeah, um, for this is, sorry, yeah, and this is Nancy. I have a quick question if you don't mind. Um, do you run into any problems computationally when you have a lot of flat areas? Sometimes when there's not a lot going on or there's only really minimal changes, you can get, I don't know, kind of divergent computations or run into trouble. Do you see anything like that? Uh, yes, uh, it depends on the distribution of the flat and how the, the DM domain, data domain is decomposed. Um, it happens uh, if there can be an extreme case that uh, all when by the way you decompose the data, all the flats are local and you don't need to do any uh, communication. Uh, in this diagram, you can see a, a big river actually uh, flows from top to bottom. If we do the row wise decomposition, um, it, um, this flat will involve all the processors. So uh, there's a lot of uh, load imbalance, but uh, uh, there is also a trade-off between identifying all the flats uh, and uh, dispatching the flats to the processors versus uh, just treating the flats as uh, crossing boundary and do the dummy uh, work uh, anyway. Um, and because anyway, the, the whole process is uh, uh, bottlenecked by the long flat resolving if it involves a communication. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot, yeah. Okay, thank you. So we did some uh, 
sparse partitioning of the flats and to reduce in order to reduce the memory usage and uh, use the uh, uh, non-blocking MPI communication instead of uh, blocking communications uh, among the processors to speed up the uh, uh, communication. Um, this just illustrates different ways to decompose the data. So the new algorithm is like this. As I mentioned, we differentiate the local and share the flats, and uh, for the shared flats, we involve the communication. If not, uh, the shared flats, we just process locally. And the sequential improvement is a lot. Um, compared to ours, on one processor, we can do it in, in 15 seconds for a small uh, DEM. And um, this is an illustration of the boundary data uh, exchange. Uh, it has some logic in it, but the, the, the rationale is that if, if a processor couldn't find the either inlet or outlet cells in its processor, it does nothing. Uh, but uh, it only does things when it gets the update from neighbors where uh, the, the inlets and the outlet cells can be found and the, the labeling can happen. But if, uh, uh, for the bottom case, if uh, both processors have the uh, in, uh, outlet cells they, for the, the gradient toward the outlet cells, they can do the same. They can do the labeling at the same time and only uh, uh, treat the boundary cases uh, on the uh, bottom right. Um, and the result is is significant. Uh, then. Uh, with the new algorithm, we can process the whole U.S. Um, in, by using 200 cores uh, in a little bit above uh, five minutes. So that's a big improvement to make uh, this uh, NAFI uh, methodology uh, feasible because we need a, a responsive turnaround time to, in order to communicate the results with uh, the researchers. <laughs> And there's more performance data. Uh, it's a uh, uh, thing that exceeds 16 publication if you're interested. And uh, we extend the, the Todd EM uh, as a science gateway service in two places. Uh, one is associated with the LIDAR data portal uh, the open topography at the SPSC. The other is with uh, us, the CyberGS uh, uh, gateway and the HydroShare, the hydrological uh, analysis uh, portal. This is the interface of uh, open, topography, open topography on the right. And on the bottom, that's the TAUDM extension. And the data source is generated from the latter points and now integrated into the open topography as an enhanced feature. This work is done uh, by working with uh, Chen Tan uh, and Vishu uh, at SDSC. And Vishu, I believe, is, is here. Um, the second part, the CyberGS HydroShare interoperability, is the interoperability between two science gateways. Uh, the CyberGS gateway is an online problem solving environment, and it's where the computation happens. And HydroShare hosts all the hydrological data set, including the hot EM. <laughs> uh, in, sorry, in, include the DM resources. CyberGS has a hot EM deployed. <laughs> and we talk to each other through at the security level through OAuth and at the service level through the REST API. <coughs> the goal is to be able to uh, launch a uh, Tau DEM service on any DEM resources hosted in HydroShare uh, through two applications. One is the web application, another is the Jupyter notebook application. And we use them. Um, uh, the, this is the illustration of the interoperability uh, through the OAuth uh, authentication and data retrieval and uh, update through the REST API. We use a we call it generic resource GR model to create a, a data resource which uh, is a, the user space uh, and user dumps the DM in, and we also, uh, the Tau DM also dumps all the output into the single uh, data back. And this is uh, the uh, web interface of the web application uh, for Tau DM. It allows the users to specify the functional dependencies of multiple Tau DM functions and select the data from the data back and uh, function parameters. And it runs on Roger. And once it's done, the results uh, 
uh, are pushed back to the hydro share through the REST API. And this is the Todd EM uh, note, uh, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, it's Python code. It's for classroom and uh, methodology development purpose. Um, people have been using that in uh, classroom. David Hobson used this, developed this, and uh, we think it is a very uh, convenient way to communicate and uh, combine a couple of the computation. Uh, and we host this uh, notebook on Roger Cloud component. So, if you are still with me, uh, we accelerated Tau DM so that the, the raster related green boxes in this diagram, the diagram, the functions, can be accelerated to the point that we can do at the national level in a reasonable amount of time. And then we can compute the hand raster. <coughs> Uh, the hand raster development uh, is, is mainly a methodolo methodological uh, workflow development uh, through the coordination of weekly meetings amongst um, the researchers. And this is a, a Roger environment with the, the geospatial and Taoyuan deployment. And the, uh, we do the hex level of computation using MPI, and uh, all the high throughput uh, computing. Uh, jobs are managed through uh, uh, e either the individual jobs or GNU parallel uh, for embarrassingly parallel jobs for visualization example. Hey, yeah. And this is the, sorry. Sorry, this is Nancy. We have a question on chat. Um, how big are the data for user uploads and downloads? I think this was a couple of slides ago when you showed the workflow. Uh, user, uh, the, data, the input data is produced by USGS. Uh, it's not realistic for users to upload uh, for NEFI. They can uh, upload to PowDM if they only care about a subset of the data. Uh, the whole data set for the national elevation data set is a little bit uh, below one terabyte, and we make a copy from USGS. And we have an updating scheme when the USGS updates their data set. They update the national elevation data set every three months, three months. Not the whole data, but a, um, a pre-scheduled uh, portion. And okay. for the for the for the downloading part, uh, in order to give the results to the users, we use IROTS to push the data back to TAC. I think it's on Wrangler uh, for the tech people for the UT Austin people to download to their desktop. And visualization, because we host a visualization service on the same cluster, uh, which uh, is mounted with the GPFS system, so that's not a problem. We don't need to move data. Okay, thanks. Uh, all the data are downloadable from web. Uh, if, we, if you want to attempt to download uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was the question, is whether this was going over HTTP, and I, I think you've answered that. Yeah, it, it's, it's doable, but it's not realistic. Uh, let's put it that way. So that's why we need to give them the visual uh, results um, uh, immediately for them to assess the, the correctness and or the potential improvements. I'll talk about that part uh, a little bit later. So the hydrologists were excited about this map. This is the first 10 meter resolution uh, hand map. You can see uh, from hydrological perspective, uh, the topographic features of the entire terrain and which part is, is prone to flood. Uh, and there are some byproducts uh, that are of uh, hydrologists interest. We also published them. Um, computation wise, it, uh, the whole computation after using the new flow direction algorithm took about uh, 1.34 CPU years, and we did it in uh, uh, less than two days, I think, thir uh, 36 hours. And uh, the currently, after using the new uh, flow direction algorithm, uh, the, that part only takes uh, less, uh, less than 13% of the time. Most of the time currently it's bottlenecked on the pre and the post processing of the data set because we had to use a sequential geospatial software, GDAL, for doing that. And this is the uh, computing time for each uh, hand unit. Uh, this compared the old, uh, the one 
the workflow using the old and new uh, flow direct algorithms. And we also did some scalability test if we are going to use uh, finer uh, resolution DEMs, where you use the three meter uh, DEM, which is 10 times bigger. And we can see from the diagram that uh, the flow direction algorithm uh, time also increased, but not by much. The most part is on the, uh, the blue, uh, the, the green and the top green and the bottom red, those parts of the, main, the sequential parts, we had no way to accelerate. We might want to rewrite that into parallel algorithm uh, specifically later. Yeah, and with sorry. the hand. Sorry, we have one more question. Um, Mona, do you okay. want to unmute and ask? That's probably more direct. Can you get to your mute button, Mona? Okay, the question was on the whole U.S. map. Uh, oh, okay. Do you want to go ahead and ask, Mona? I don't think you can hear me. Uh, just barely. Can you speak up? Oh, okay. Um, uh, yes, on that map, I didn't quite understand. Is the dark blue the flooded areas or the non-flooded areas? So this is, a, this is a map not on the flooded area. This is a, to calculate the relative reference uh, height. Uh, so you can see uh, some uh, things that uh, that uh, n not intuitive. For example, there are a lot of uh, uh, blue areas in the deserts. These are the potential flooding, flooding area, but because it has no precipitation, uh, in, in, when you translate that into inundation map, you don't see those. And for, for the coastal area in the east and the south, you can see obviously the New Orleans part is very easy to be flooded because uh, the reference height uh, is low. Thank you. Thank you. So with the hand, you can immediately to uh, uh, combine uh, that with the uh, other data set to assess, uh, to do some ba uh, uh, basic rough estimation. This is a map derived by David Maidenman's group uh, to uh, associate the hand value with the uh, address points and the residential polygons. Then immediately you can see which parts are prone to flood risk, even without considering any forecast and water depth uh, data. So that's a lot of, uh, that generates a, a lot of interest in the hydrology and the emergency management uh, community after they saw that. Okay, so let me move to the inundation mapping part. So given the hand, we're going to compute a lot of uh, a series of uh, hydro properties and also once for all the 2.7 million river riches. And the way we do it, uh, this is a brief of the methodology, with a hand and the sum assumption on the water depth. You can calculate the river channel depth, volume, uh, such information. Uh, most importantly, you can calculate the, the uh, discharge information. So uh, uh, we predefine the levels of uh, water depth, we call stages. We calculate 82 stages and calculate the river discharge for each stage. And that forms a lookup table. With that table, if uh, there is a forecast uh, then from uh, national water model, it forecasts the water discharge. We can compare the discharge the forecast uh, with the uh, value in the table and uh, get the water depth forecast. And with the water, which, which is denoted by the red lines, and with that uh, flood depth value, and we compare with the hand value to produce inundation map. This is the methodology. Uh, first, we get the forecast data from uh, NWM, and we look up the table, we compare with the hand raster, and for each, we produce the inundation map also at 10 meter resolution, so that each uh, 10 meter by 10 meter cell is uh, propagated with uh, the uh, 
flooded uh, or not information, and if flooded, how much. And this is the computational workflow. Uh, it is not that computationally intensive, but uh, uh, originally we used a generic uh, geospatial software to do the queries against the millions of uh, vectors. Uh, it is a query of uh, millions of uh, polygons against millions of lines. That was uh, horrible. Uh, the generic uh, query performance was not acceptable. So we had to specifically code those parts using um, the hash table in C++ and the Python scripts. And uh, so this part is not computationally intensive, but the inundation mapping part, when you, uh, when you get to the inundation forecast, the green box there, uh, and the inundation forecast table, uh, the purple box on the bottom left, uh, we have to create the maps. In order to create the maps, we have to associate it with the hand map and produce, produce the same size of uh, inundation forecast raster. And in order to visualize that, we have to create a, uh, about half size of that you know, as a pyramid tiles for visualization purpose. We only currently support the six zooming levels and it's already half of the, uh, the forecast raster size. So we are not happy about that part yet and are working on it. And this is the, mainly the challenge uh, because the NWM gives hourly um, uh, um, forecast. In order to match up the real time uh, forecasting, we have to match the computation the performance to the hourly um, uh, prediction intervals. So that part, I think we can meet the uh, challenge of um, in deriving the forecast table that's already achieved. Of course, since we have parallel computing and the NWM gives you uh, hourly forecast for a lot of intervals, you can do it in parallel, but we, it cannot be too slow because the forecast comes in uh, Frequently. So the responsiveness of this inundation mapping service is really currently not on the computation, but on the creation of the visualization. Um, this is the first map we calculated two weeks ago. That's the first time we, we achieved this, uh, to calculate the map for the whole nation um, for one timestamp. Uh, it's the December 8th last year. And that's what it looks like. It makes sense if the most of the US is bluish, then it's a big problem. Um, but uh, uh, flood is local. So people are very much interested in the local impact maps of this uh, inundation mapping. And we're still resolving that. In summary, uh, this is the table for all the details of data sizes and the computational performance. Just if, uh, if you are interested, you can contact me for more detailed explanation. Uh, we are working on, with a team to refine the methodology. Um, there are a lot of uh, um, problems, for example, the methodology doesn't work well on coastal area, or on flat area, where the elevation cannot be solely used as the criteria to derive the uh, flood risk. Uh, and even the water flow directions, they change season by season. Um, so there are a lot of complicated issues that we are working with. Uh, the hydrolog hydrologist uh, to resolve by using higher resolution DM, for example, the LIDAR derived, and the visualization challenge I mentioned. And uh, the hydrologists, they outreach our effort to uh, government agencies, um, for example, USGS and uh, NOAA, NWS. Uh, I think they received very positive feedback on this uh, whole new methodology. And so, in conclusion, we built the first hand raster by accelerating tau DM and the com constructing the high throughput computing approach for the workflow. And we also produced the first uh, 10 meter resolution real time inundation map. And we're catching up to uh, the responsiveness requirements of uh, the real time forecasting as a follow up work. Um, so far, yeah, uh, could you take a question? I think Sudhakar's got a yeah. question if you want to unmute Sudhakar. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thanks Jan, it's a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, so does this uh, infrastructure enable uh, anybody to 
modify some of these uh, you know models and test uh, a modified inundation maps for example let us say if i build a dam or something and you know change the certain properties of uh, a flowing river does i mean of course that impacts the uh, i mean other things will this uh, yeah. can i do oh. that and then remodel the uh, the flows and uh, and and the and the changes in the uh, flood yes so everything we did in these two projects are open uh, the software pieces are open the hand workflow is hosted on github taldm itself has a github repository and all the data we publish online uh, uh, on roger cloud so you can download the data you can couple the code and you can change the workflow for example, the, the dam and the road, if you have a methodology to change the DEM of your own, you can change that part of the code. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, and then, so once I change it, can I resubmit that uh, model again back into the portal easily? Uh, that part, uh, not right now. Uh, that, that we're still developing the Jupyter uh, environment. Mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, currently, our Jupyter notebook can only work on inside of one VM. And even though we can uh, mount the backend storage system in the VM, um, the computation part, uh, it's still within that VM. So we are building some uh, middleware services to be able to submit it to the cluster. Uh, and uh, the data propagation to the storage system. Uh, after that, you can take the existing, uh, well, we are still developing the hand notebook, actually. Uh, but after we've done that, uh, then you can take the hand notebook and the change of the Python code or the, uh, or the C++ code. Uh, and uh, stitch them together and send to uh, the backend cluster for computation. So, uh, but the Jupyter gives an in interface uh, to the backend resources and uh, a way to modify the whole workflow. Great. Cool. It is it is a good question. What what type of person would so someone who's an urban planner who's planning you know, flood mitigation strategies or dams or things like that, they would they would likely have to work with someone to alter this model to understand the implications of changes they make. Right? They probably wouldn't have enough knowledge to to change the model themselves. Do you do you see those kinds of partnerships being needed? Or yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, since the first uh, version of hand availability, uh, we have received uh, a lot of requests. Uh, basically, uh, David Maiderman and David Hoppen, re they received a lot of requests to evaluate the model, change the model. Uh, so they, they are framing that into, uh, they, they also need to teach the students. Students need to change the model to do some other methodology development. So this uh, uh, Jupyter thing is really the key for them. Uh, for example, they're, they're having the summer institute this summer in the National Water Center at Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And they'll probably mainly rely on the Jupyter notebook to do all these things. But of course, uh, it, it is framed if an expertise is needed to understand the hand workflow, although it's published. Um, uh, this is a community, community engagement effort that ha those people, um, well, they already know David Maiderman's group well, so they usually direct questions there, and uh, then they, if uh, the question is related to computation, they will redirect the questions to me. I'm not saying this is an efficient way to do that, but uh, that's uh, because the, the, these projects are still at the prototyping stage, uh, currently, uh, that's not our focus. But once the prototype is published and released, then uh, that's a real problem that I have not thought through uh, carefully yet. Great. Thanks, Jan. Uh, we have one more question, but I also want to let you finish your slides. I don't know how close you are to the end. Okay. So, 
uh, since I'm both an ECSS staff and a Science Gateway staff, I'd like to give some uh, reflection on the, these two projects in, in both um, perspectives. For the ES ECSS part, it, this NEFI project is an, an unusual case that uh, actually computation drives the development of new methodologies for research. I know a lot of cases people have the computation problems, you come, they come with the code, you modify the code, but in this case, uh, without computation, they cannot see the national view of uh, all the intermediate results. And from there, uh, because they only, they're only familiar with uh, the study area they are interested in, and um, on, there are a lot of things they did not see at national scale but only through computation and the, the um, fast coupling of these results and delivery to them that they can do this at the scale. <coughs> and um, for the science uh, gateway part, I think uh, how to use the hybrid uh, supercomputing architecture in favor of uh, lowering the barrier for end user uh, solution development is critical. Uh, so we use Roger, um, but well, let me give some slides here. Uh, from the proposal stage, uh, we proposed the Roger be, uh, being split into three parts. Um, the traditional HPC part, a Hadoop cluster to host scalable databases and uh, data intensive computing platforms, and uh, the cloud part. Um, and the coupling is through the storage system and the uh, middleware services and we have a five petabyte uh, storage, usable storage. Um, for the NEFI and Pau DEM, we only use the OpenStack uh, cloud and HPC part. Um, if we only have the HPC part, which is a traditional way, it will be really hard for me to communicate all the results to them, for them to see the results immediately. And I have to set up my own uh, Web servers, mapping servers, and the, the data movement would be would making it impossible for me to communicate these results in time. And if you let the users wait for too long, say, "Okay, I'll do this. I'll communicate the uh, Tau DEM results back to you in two months." Uh, they won't come back. So uh, this is a Roger uh, introduction and the software environment uh, and the NEFI deployment there and uh, both the data and code so that they have a very tangible access even though they know little about the computation details which uh, actually I manage most of the time. And uh, also for the ECSS part, we do weekly meetings on Thursday morning 10 a.m. Central Time almost every week. So that's I think also important to engage the community so that Nothing gets loose uh, after a uh, period of time of idling. And uh, again, the Jupyter part, I think uh, it, is, it is very important if we have a Jupyter uh, environment before we start the, this project. Uh, if they can look at the code, they, they point to me that, oh, that part is not right. You should use vertical distance instead of a horizontal distance. And I can immediately change the code instead of uh, like in a, a week turnaround time. And uh, even for Science Gateway applications development, I think Jupyter has potential. If you look at the uh, top right, um, this is the job submission cell we customized for Roger. It is a generic QSUP uh, interface. With, it, is a, it is a cell, it is not Python code. You can actually uh, compose a web interface within the cell and submit the jobs and monitor jobs. And you can also do the mapping in the cells. So with this, uh, which is the current uh, ongoing work to cook the hand and inundation mapping notebooks, I think it's just a very new, new but effective way to communicate the development effort with the, the PIs and even for end users like students. And with that, these are the resources if you're interested and these are the funds related to the two projects. And that's all, thank you. And yeah. I have some appendix 
uh, slides if you're interested in the methodology more. Thanks very much for a terrific talk, Yan. Uh, we did have one question that I skipped over in the interest of time earlier, and that was about um, what for Tau DEM have been optimized and available so far. Uh, we optimized the pit remove to support the block wide decomposition. We op optimized uh, uh, both D infinite and D8 uh, flow direction algorithms using the strategies I mentioned earlier. Um, so, uh, and we optimized uh, overall uh, the parallel IO part. Uh, that's the work in 2014. Great. Any other questions for Yan from folks on the call? You're welcome to unmute and ask. Yan is our GIS expert in ECSS, so since GIS can often cross multiple domains, you can kind of keep that expertise in mind if it comes up in any of your projects. Uh, great work, Yan, as usual. Uh, one quick question I had, uh, I saw that you had the 3D elevation data I mean, the 3D elevation program, uh, USGS one meter, five meter on Roger, was that correct? Yeah, well, we directly uh, got those data from the USGS group. How big are Not, the one meter? Uh, it, it, we, we use the three meter data. We okay. checked the one meter data availability that it, it is uh, dispersed not enough to do the test. So we use some three meter data uh, in East Coast, uh, but even three meter data uh, it's not uh, it's not there yet for the national coverage. Okay, great. Uh, maybe one of the things I'm wondering would be possible is to just like we did with Tau DM, maybe uh, uh, make it into a workflow with uh, a flooding map. Yes. Yes. So if you look at the GitHub uh, repository of the NEFI flood map, the, the second link under the code uh, item, um, uh, everything is, is still in prototype. I put everything in the test subdirectory. I have not gotten time to polish the code yet. But uh, for each step, um, uh, um, uh, I would expose them as an individual uh, component and has an interface. In that way, we can build uh, uh, the OPPO 2 services uh, around those. Uh, great. Thanks for the great presentation. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Very good. Right up at the top of the hour, Yan, thanks very much for volunteering to give such an interesting talk, uh, taking the full hour to, for, for these two projects. Uh, I think we all learned a lot, and thanks for your time in preparing and presenting these um, very hot off the presses results. Sounds like some of the computations were just done last month, so that's, uh, that, that's terrific. And, yeah. The inundation map was done this month. <laughs> oh, wow. Boy, boy that, that, that's gutsy planning your talk um, before the results are even in. Yeah, but, uh, when we scheduled the talk, I actually didn't know if we could do it. Yeah. But uh, fortunately. Uh, yeah, All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll, we'll see you next month at the February ECSM Symposium. Thanks again, Jan.